so that so that uh, you know we can post this up onto YouTube. So, anyways, why don't we? Uh, we obviously have people coming in, uh, but um, but anyways, I, I'm Martin Desmond, and so and what I'll do is I'll just individually pick on everybody, and so so if you just Martin, sort of you're muted. Okay. No, I, yeah, no, you, you should be able to hear me. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll just go around and introduce, or uh, I'll, I'll just sort of call it a person's name. And if you just been, you know, into, you know, identify who you are and 15 seconds of your life story. So anyway, I'll first pick on my good friend, Joanne. Um, <clears throat> I'm Joanne Savar and I've got my mouth full of dinner <laughs> and, uh, I live in Walport, and um, I am getting pretty old, so I'm not very, I'm more of a spectator than I am an activist lately. But um, I have been active in a lot of different causes through the years, and uh, so I'm very progressive. <laughs> Great, thanks, Joanne. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Bush, um, Toledo City Council and an artist and I'm brand new to city government. So this is all a new learning experience for me. <laughs> Great, we're glad you're here, Kim. Rima? Thank you for having me. Hi everyone, my name is Rima. It's good to see everyone here and concerned and that makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm in Depot Bay. Great, thanks Rima. Sydney? Hi, I'm Sydney Kasner. I'm a city councilor in Lincoln City. Um, I also work at the Samaritan North Lincoln Hospital um, in the imaging department. <clears throat> and I've lived in Lincoln City for about five years now. And I'm a I'm a lifer. So <laughs> thanks, Sydney. Let's see, Betty. <clears throat> I'm Betty Kamakawa, Toledo City Council President. And um groundfish aging specialist and agronomist and uh, just uh, doing my part to help science. <laughs> Great. How about Representative Gomberg or Dave? Dave Gomberg. Hi, everybody. David Gomberg here, um, state representative from House District 10, which now runs from Lincoln City to Junction City and from Philomath to um, uh, Florence. Um, thanks so much uh, uh, to all of those of you that supported me in this last election. It, uh, it's been an interesting ride. And, um, and uh, next step is that we're going to be uh, preparing for the incoming legislative session. I'm looking forward to your guidance as we tackle a lot of really big and important questions in the next few months. Thanks, Dave. Let's say Craig. Yeah, uh, Craig Birdie. I am the mayor-elect of Yahats. Um, a uh, volunteer in general, and especially like getting my hands dirty and do uh, lots of plant restoration. I think the worst part of becoming mayor is that uh, I'll have to give up some of that, but uh, uh, just uh, excited to be here and hear what folks have to say and learn more about the grant process. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Rod, up next. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for having us. My name is Rod Cross. I'm the mayor of the city of Toledo. I've been a registered, unaffiliated voter for 32 years, and that's how I run my politics. I don't care about left or right. I care about getting the job done the best way for the most amount of people. Great. Thanks, Rod. Uh, Tom? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Cambridge. I do outreach and education with the Mid Coast Watersheds Council based out of Newport. Um, and we coordinate volunteer days and have monthly community meetings. So just interested to hear your thoughts on it. And yeah, thanks for having me. Great, appreciate you being here, Tom. Uh, Susan? Yes, um, hi. <laughs> I am uh, going to have the camera off most of the time because I'm fixing dinner. I'm Susan Walkie, uh, mayor of Lincoln City, recently reelected. I can serve a full four years this time. So I've lived in North Lincoln County for 
over 30 years now and um, have my career was as a legal secretary, but I'm retired now. Great. Thanks, Susan. Rala? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations to all those folks who won their elections. I thought uh, Representative Gomberg was an excellent talent on his TV spots. <laughs> <laughs> They did a very nice job. So anyway, I'm here to try to uh, move the ball forward a little bit on environmental issues and uh, looking for help on uh, down the road for political campaigns and so forth that may be coming up in the next couple of years. So just here to help any way I can. Thanks, Rala. Casey? Excuse me there. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Casey Miller. Uh, many of you know me as public information officer for Lincoln County. I am coming to you from a hotel room in Eugene tonight, <clears throat> annual association of counties, new commissioner orientation as your commissioner elect. Um, yeah, glad to be here joining the conversation. This uh, schedule here has been moving around a little bit, but I'm glad I could make it. You know, I'm really excited to hear um, Rachel's um, you know, ideas tonight, and she's done good work for us and the county commissioner's office and looking forward to seeing what she's got for us. So good to see everyone. Great. Thanks. Appreciate you being able to show up, Casey. Um, Ryan? Sorry, I just realized my mute was off. I was stuffing my face. I just got back from work. Um, I'm Ryan on the Newport City Council. Nobody ran for my seat, so I ran for it again. Amazingly, I won. Um, what else? I'm a big fan of a clean environment with reliable drinking water and uh, spent a lot of my time advocating for a community dam in Newport so that we can uh, replace our failing earthen dams. I spent a lot of my energy on that. Um, also uh, advocating for a, a retooling of um, the 1977 Beach Bill through work. So I think it's time. And uh, my city obligations aside, I think that it'd be nice for the legislature to take a look at uh, more uh, fact-based ocean shore planning. Great, thanks Ryan. Fred? Hello, I'm Fred Holzmer. Uh, sorry, my camera's off. I've got an unstable internet connection. I live in Newport. I'm a retired water resources consultant. I'm on the board of the Midcoast Watersheds Council. Thank you, Tom, for joining the group here to be part of this. And I want to thank everybody, all the elected officials, for all of the work you do. It's, it's uh, impressive. Um, Mike Broyley and I recently leaned on the city of Newport to form a water advisory committee, which fortunately was supported and is now being kicked off with representatives from uh, industry, from the fish packers, the fishing, lodging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have not had our first meeting, but that will be coming up soon. Um, Lastly, just that I'm out of the area. I'm spending the winter in Baja, so I'm not in the neighborhood, but I want to stay connected. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this discussion. Did well, that's swimming? a bummer. Yeah, I know. did you go <laughs> swimming today, Fred, in the Gulf? Or when was it be the Gulf, but down there. Um, let's see, CM? Great. Hi, folks. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I can't see me, but uh, hello. Um, I'm CM Hall. My pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. And I just got elected to my second term on the Newport City Council. I've been in Newport since 2015. It was 20 years before I thought I could dream to live here, but I got very lucky. And um, in my day life, I am a sign language interpreter, and a lot of my work is related to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and justice. And uh, I am, was pleased to be endorsed uh, by the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. And I feel like that's pertinent because there are quite a few folks who are really um, passionate about the environment on this uh, Zoom. And I will be off uh, camera also taking care of dinner. Thanks, Sam. And let's see. Um, 
June, uh, uh, June O'Connor, I, I, I think she says uh, she, she has an unstable internet connection. Um, I, I, I don't know if you want to jump in, Joan, um, but um, if not, I, I'm just assuming you're not able to. So anyways, um, I, I left Rachel to the last and I, I think, wait, I think, I think every, I think we've gone through everybody else. And uh, so anyways, we're really pleased to have uh, Rachel here tonight from Sequoia Consulting to talk about the Pathways Report and how to build capacity. And so I think, I think with that, Rachel, I think I'm just going to turn it over to you. Um, oh, maybe, maybe just sort of a little bit, you know, I was thinking, you know, Rachel can speak for like 15 minutes. I assume, you know, people have like 10 minutes of questions or whatever. And then, then, then a couple of you have a number of issues and items uh, that, that, that you also want to discuss so, so we can also get to those items uh, after Rachel's presentation. So with that, Rachel, you can... Um, and you should actually, let me, let me oh, make, yeah. you got to give me, yeah. yeah, there, I just said on the, uh, the share screen. So, so sometimes it takes a little bit to, yeah, there we go. Okay. Let's do presenters here. Oop. Let's see. Slideshow. All right. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah, it's looking great. Awesome. Great. Well, first of all, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, I know many of you, either professionally or personally, so it feels like an easy, easy presentation tonight for you guys. Um, hopefully, Rod, don't give me too much grief. <laughs> <laughs> um, really excited to bring this to you guys here today um, to talk about the report. Um, so, Sequoia, I'll, let's let me just do this real quick. This is who I am. This is my contact information. I'll make sure. Um, that Martin has these slides if you guys want to go ahead and go over them because I'm not sure that I'm going to have time enough to cover everything today. Um, and this is right in the way, isn't it? Hold on. There we go. So, so I started Sequoia Consulting at the start of the pandemic because I saw how many opportunities and how much funding rural communities were leaving on the table. And there was just a huge gap in terms of people willing, willing to put the time and effort and like have the expertise to help um, bridge that gap essentially. So <clears throat> we're a uh, rural consult consulting assistance firm um, and we focus on resource development and helping support new initiatives. Um, I'm here today in large part because of the work that we've been doing with the Ford Family Foundation over the last year. So the Ford Family Foundation was interested in figuring out what are the what are the challenges for rural communities in securing state and federal funding? And so they commissioned us to create a report, which I will go over some of the results. Um, but also, and I think just as importantly, they've done some follow on work with us and they've put together some tools and resources for rural communities to use, which I will also go over in this report. But I'm going to kind of use this as an opportunity to um, oh, let's see to help you understand the key challenges, which I'm sure you kind of already know, right? I mean, this is not rocket science here. Um, and then also become familiar with the tools, the Ford Families Foundation. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what, what makes for a strong um, application as well. Any questions? Okay. And I would actually say, um, feel free to, to raise your hand if, if throughout the presentation, there is something that you are um, a little bit curious about, okay? Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask is I want to ask, what do you guys think are the, well, what have you experienced as the biggest challenges to securing state and federal funding, either for your communities or for your organization? Okay, I'll, I'll answer. Lack of, of funding to hire consultants or people to write grants. Right. Lack of lack of organizational bandwidth to jump through all the hoops. Okay. Um, that then, is th that's why we hired Sequoia Consulting at the city of Toledo because they have allowed us to access a lot of grants and a lot of other funding that we otherwise <laughs> just don't have the capabilities to do. Anyone else? Sometimes um, difficulty finding 
the funding, mm -hmm. the sources. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would, yeah, I, I would say um, being in a position of having, you know, getting a shovel ready in <clears> time <throat> for a, a grant that uh, you may or may not have known about. Right. Anyone else? And then, did you purposely limit this to government sources as opposed to nonprofits or, or foundations? Uh, so, well, I think you can kind of extrapolate a lot of this to those sources as well, but those sources are easier for rural communities to access. I'm not saying they're easy, but oftentimes, particularly federal grants, are some of the most challenging. And the report that we did for the Ford Family Foundation focused specifically on barriers to accessing state and federal funding. Okay, all right, well, I'm gonna move this on really quickly. So I wanna go over really quickly so everyone is just really clear. These are the assets you need for a competitive application. And generally, like this is a little bit more extensive than what you'd need for like private philanthropy, but it's not saying that you don't need those as well. But for state and federal um, applications, particularly federal, you absolutely need the support of your state elected representatives. Like they can be your friends in this process. And I know Representative Gomberg has been involved in a lot of community projects and offering support. Um, so this is really important to make sure and not assume that somebody else has already let them know about the project, right? Um, and the other thing is you got you have to give your um, representatives um, uh, time uh, ahead of time to be able to make sure that they can provide those letters of support. And so this is both our, our state and our federal representatives. Um, you have to have a well-developed project. Um, you know, this includes having a good case statement with data behind it about what the need is, the goals, deliverables, timelines, budgets. Oh, yes, Representative Gomberg. Well, I didn't mean to cut you off in mid-sentence. That's okay. But, but, but I just wanted to augment that a little bit. Um, we need people to let us know when they're applying for grants. And nothing is more frustrating than to find out you didn't get a grant and we didn't know anything about the application until you got turned down. Um, now, that being said, um, if you want us to get behind an application, the easiest thing to do is to reach out and ask for our support and then provide us with a draft letter so that we don't have to start from scratch in advocating for your ask. Um, write the letter for us. We'll tweak it, we'll put it into our own um, voice, but write the letters for us and we'll be happy to add them to your, <coughs> excuse me, portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And also I know in working with Merc, uh, well, Merkley and Wyden's teams, um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that they also require is they require a draft of your application and a link to the application materials themselves so they can do their due diligence. So um, yeah, make it easy for them to support you, <laughs> definitely. And you are lucky to have very approachable um, uh, folks in Representative Gomberg and Senator Anderson. So this kind of, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, this kind of goes to the next bullet point, which is stakeholder support. So for you to be competitive at state and federal levels, and even at, you know, private philanthropy less so, but you need to have multi, so public, private, and nonprofit partners coming to the table. The more diverse um, support that you can show, the better off you're going to be. Financial match. I know this is an issue. I know this is an issue particularly for small communities. Um, but the thing to do is before an application even opens up, um, you know, think about where can you get match from? I know that you all are great at finding resources, you know, from partners who, and sometimes match can be in kind as well. So get started on that process early, right? Um, you also need to have the internal and external capacity to apply for and manage grants. This is no small thing, right? Especially when you have small communities or small organizations of like three to 10 people, right? I mean, that's a lot to ask. And so one of the things that we recommend is that um, partnering with others who may have more of that administrative backbone that can support an application, both in the application phase and in the management phase of this. And of course, you need to line up your technical experts right now, like especially engineering firms for infrastructure projects and others are in high demand. So going 
looking for those early is really good. And then of course you need to have your internal grant management and financial policies in place. So you can just think about what of these assets do you currently have? And we actually, um, my colleague Sherry and I, we give a more um, in-depth training on, on, on it's grant readiness training that we can talk to you all about if that's something, a, a path that you wanna go down, but this is kind of just a snippet from that. So the pathways to rural federal funding report that we did with the um, Ford family, on behalf of the Ford Family Foundation, um, you know, I don't think this is gonna surprise anyone, but the three areas that were the biggest challenges are capacity, expertise, and external resources. Oops, I'm gonna put this over here so you guys can see this. Um, so only 50% of the entities that we interviewed, and we interviewed both jurisdictions as well as nonprofits in this process, um, only 50% at the time of the report had actually applied for federal funding, um, and only about half were aware of um, federal funding opportunities they might qualify for. And then you get down when you get down to it, especially at the federal level, like there's just a lot of challenges. Like it's knowing where to look, it's understanding your eligibility, not only eligibility, but your competitiveness, right? Actually completing the application and then having the capacity to manage federal funding. And I'm gonna move this over here. And if if somebody raises their hand, I only have a, I have a limited screen of where I can see you guys. So please just jump in as well. All right, well, it's not moving around for me. So capacity, this speaks to what we um, talked about a little bit before, which is like, you know, there's just limited budgets, there's limited bandwidth. And within this report, in each of these areas, we came up with a set of recommendations um, that we believe can kind of help um, bridge the gap here. Um, so the first was to create and disseminate a federal grant readiness assessment. That is actually something that the Ford Family Foundation has already done, and I'll give you links to that at the end of this project, at the end of this presentation. Um, connect small rural organizations and jurisdictions to existing coalitions. This speaks to the, you know, find your partners who have that administrative backbone. And then provide grants for planning, engineering, and design, and coalition building, and to hire grant writers. This is one of the biggest gaps that we see, right? So grant writers don't come cheap. Um, and you have to invest money to make money, but it is like a 12 to 12 to 24 month payback period, because depending on the grant cycle that you hit, um, you know, it just, it, it, the return on investment takes a little while to be seen. Sometimes you get lucky and it's right away. Um, my colleague Sherry just got one of only um, 10 Department of Justice uh, grants in the United States for a very small nonprofit the other day. Um, so it just depends. Um, but there's, you know, there needs to be more of this money for this pre-planning and development phase. And I don't think there is any one answer to how we get to that solution, but we know that that's a huge, um, it's a huge need. So then um, oop, ah. the other area is that the challenge is expertise, right? So especially not as much as state, but definitely for federal, like those are just difficult processes and you need to tap into people who have um, the experience to kind of, you know, help you flow through that process. I'm sorry, it is 6 p.m. My, my words are a little tripping over myself. So. <laughs> um, so some of our immediate recommendations were to create a live federal prospect document. Um, that is easily searchable, and we have done that, and that is part of the work that we're doing with the Ford Family Foundation. Now, their focus has been broadly on economic development, but um, the prospecting documents we put together are basically, we do some sense making for you instead of you having to go through grants.gov and look at all of these other sources. We talk about what are the entities that are eligible, what's the match requirement, we put it all up front, and I'll show you that document here in a little bit. Um, the other thing is that we talked about data. The need for making a case is really important. And sometimes it's a challenge just to find where that data is. And so the idea that we had is like, well, wouldn't that be great if there were some data navigator positions for a region or um, you know, even for the state? And this is something that could happen within an economic development district, for example. Um, and then eligibility and prospect. So eligibility and prospecting nav navigator. So it's great to have a, a, a prospecting document that you can go through, but like knowing if you're eligible sometimes takes some finesse. 
that's one of the things that we do a lot for our clients actually. So, um, and then whoo, external resources. So this is identifying and securing eligible match. We know this is a challenge, right? So um, one of the things that we recommend is that um, entities like the Ford Family Foundation or representatives can provide letters of support for communities applying for federal funding. This really does help. And then we have this great idea, but it's not being implemented yet. It might be a bit challenging to do so, but de developing a pooled um, responsive match fund um, to help rural communities specifically when they're going after federal grants. Um, so what I'm going to show you next is the prospecting document, uh, the grant readiness assessment, grant writer roster, and a couple of other things that I want to make sure that you're aware of. So again, the prospecting document is exactly what it sounds like. It is focused on economic development just because of the nature of the Ford Family Foundation and who we're working with there. The readiness, excuse me, the readiness assessment is also what it sounds like. And it is actually the gateway to getting one-on-one -on -one grant writing support. So as part of our work with the Ford Family Foundation, they have um, they have basically allocated a certain number of hours. Um, it's up to 10 hours per entity that you guys can basically apply for. And it's free. It's our time. It's my staff and team's time um, to help support you in grant applications. In addition, there's a grant writer roster where we have vetted um, grant writers who have successfully applied for and received um, federal grants. So let me stop sharing for just a moment and pop over to oops, uh, my other, here we go, one second. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now, okay. Okay, so this is also in the um, presentation, um, but this is the, this, the, the, a lot of these tools are, they're hosted on the Oregon Economic Development District's website, just because it made the most sense um, at the time with talking to Ford. So you have a link to the pathways report. This is your federal prospecting list. Now, do you guys, did it go to the next tab or are you still on the main page? It went to, okay. So you can search by um, the program air, programmatic area, um, the status. So one of the important things I want to call to your attention is that we have put here forecasted. A lot of um, state and federal grants are cyclical, right? And so you don't want to start thinking about putting together an application when the notice of funding opportunity drops. You are most likely already too late. Um, you need to absolutely start working on that ahead of time. So it's a good idea to go through the forecasted grants and start looking at those opportunities and going, okay, what are the partners I need to pull together? What content do I already have written? What match do I need to think about? Um, your finance team will love you because we have the CFDA number there. And we're going to be posting a, um, an FAQ to this, do this document here shortly as kind of just to help people navigate through it. Focus area, the type of the grant, eligible entities, the grant range, match required, and the application platform um, if it's if it's uh, already listed. So let me pull up the next one. Um, where did this go? Okay. So um, this is the grant writer roster. So we have vetted all of these folks. So by vetting, I mean, we have looked at their successful applications and made sure they could write to the criteria that was listed in the grant um, and that they had good writing skills. And I tell you what, Sherry has a pretty, if that's my call, one of my colleagues, Sherry, she has a really high standard on this. So you can guarantee that these folks are pretty good. It even lists the price amount um, of their, whether they do hourly or flat fees. And it's very much a range. And last but not least, this is the link to the Federal Grant Readiness Survey. So we recommend that, so you have to fill this out if you wanna get one-on-one -on -one grant support. Okay, you don't have to answer all of the questions, but it will really help us to give you the services that you need um, if you do. And it's, it's, not, it's not too long, it just asks, you know, do you have experience? you know, where are you at? Do you kind of just want to be ready for federal grants? Do you have a specific project, but no opportunity? Do you have a specific project and opportunity, um, et cetera? So 
um, that is that is kind of those are that's a summary of the um, tools available right now. And so what I would suggest is like, you know, um, and this this should read state and federal, sorry. Um, so identify your community's assets and gaps now or your organization's assets and gaps. Um, determine your readiness, take that readiness assessment um, and start identifying resources and solutions for your community. And this is really sector agnostic, the information that I'm giving you. This can be about broadband, this can be about the environment, this could be about um, infrastructure projects, it's pretty applicable throughout. So that was a lot of information in a short period of time. <laughs> um, we can do more of this. Um, and I, I, we can talk to Martin or whatnot, um, if you guys need more support around this, but I would recommend going through those tools. Um, and then yeah, so what questions might you guys have? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great presentation, great presentation, Rachel. Um, yeah. Why, why don't we set aside like maybe ten minutes for questions, and then and then as I said, a number of you have other items that you'd like to bring up, though. But anyways, great presentation, Rachel. I'll send you. I'll send you a copy, Martin, after I get off here. Great. So, who wants who wants to pose the first question to Rachel? Um, Maybe I'll I'll go ahead and post the first question, Rachel. So so you know here at this meeting, you know we we have uh, you know obviously in addition to our state representative, we have uh, a county commissioner elect here, Casey. I think we have three uh, Lincoln County mayors, and you know I I don't know how many uh, city councilors we have here, but anyways, you know it's, it's really quite a broad sweep. Of folks throughout Lincoln County, and and, and so, so my question, Rachel, is, do do you, do you have some thoughts? Um, you know, given that there is this high level of interest of you know perhaps how you know the different cities and the county here in Lincoln County, you know, is it worthwhile for us to sort of try to figure out how to work together, or just you know each city sort of do their own thing, or anyway, just sort of wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Oh, well, I think it depends on the project, right? Um, I think that um, cities, when they're working with counties, they can demonstrate um, uh, greater support. Um, so I really think it just depends on the projects. I mean, there might be a very municipal focused opportunity, but that doesn't mean they can't have wider support of within the county and of different organizations in the county, et cetera. So yeah, you're really, one of the things that for both, well, honestly, for, for any level of grant, whether it's private, state, or federal, demonstrating that broad support and also having more than just a single jurisdiction as the impact area is generally going to make you more competitive. Mayor okay, so I, I think you have a tough question coming in from Rod. Well, I wouldn't say it's a tough question. Um, it's more of a, a comment. So by the very nature of this platform that we're on, one of the great things that came out of COVID was the fact that we all had to work together. Um, I was in this office back in the late 2000s. And to say that we, as the cities and the county, we were all our own little fiefdoms out there. Um, and unless one of our counselors met with someone like Martin, most people didn't even know that these groups existed. Um, the The ability for us to do this is literally the first step to successful grant writing, as we found out during the course of COVID and during the course of the last three years worth of economic upheaval. Um, if we work together, we can solve a whole lot of issues that before we all just pounded our head against. Um, one of the things I have to really tip my hat to is David Gomberg and Dick Anderson, their willingness to actually reach out to us and talk to us, um, I'll be honest, is unprecedented. Um, I was, I have been in office now through four representatives and three different senators, and these are the first two that have routinely reached out and said, what can we do for you? What are the needs of your community? Um, 
and the thing that I want to make sure doesn't get lost in all this, um, Rachel gave a great presentation and we can't let the ball get dropped. We have to stay on top of it. Um, I, I just want, I can't reiterate this enough to people how important it is that we keep communicating. We may not always agree and we may not always end up at the place where we want to be, but if we stop communicating, we might as well just turn back the clock 20 years and get flat foreheads like mine. Uh, and real quickly before we call on Councillor Kamakawa, I just want to um, also say that it is really important not to drop the ball. And one of the ways you can do that is getting yourself to shovel ready. Like get yourself to shovel ready now, have projects ready to go, have a deck of projects. You're like, well, that opportunity's out. I'm going to go for it now because I'm already prepared. So. Councillor Kamakawa? Um, you said there's 10 hours available. Is that per project, per entity? How is that? Parcel, up parcel to, it's up to 10 hours per entity. Okay. Yeah. And luckily they expanded it. So we had so much desire and need <laughs> that they doubled the initial um, amount of folks we were able to serve. So, so Rachel, just a clarification on that. That's both for uh, local governments as well as uh, nonprofits, 501c3 nonprofits. Okay. Correct. Good. All you have to be is rural and one of those entities, yep. So what other burning questions are there? Hey, everyone's Casey. Um, <clears throat> You know, I like the way this this conversation and these lines of inquiry have been sort of developing out of um, the environmental forum. And I guess I just, maybe at some point it might be important to contextualize, like, um, do we want to keep it in the environmental lane, so to speak, with this group? Um, do our, you know, and I agree with Rod, absolutely, interjurisdictional civil collaboration. <laughs> The keynote guy today was speaking a lot about how much we need civil collaboration, and it's so true, you know. Um, but do we do we go down a certain lane, Martin, from your advocacy moving forward? Do we maybe propose some models of some adjacent groups that might pursue this? Because, you know, I really am curious now, like, what is the inventory of grants that have been received? If we all had our lists that we can compare against each other, we might see where we overlap. But to Rod's point, again, we've got to keep talking about it and get somewhere, right, and work together. Absolutely. Um, so just some initial thoughts. Martin, any thoughts on the... Well, yeah, just, just briefly, and then, then I'll turn it over to Fred. Um, yeah, no, to, to, to me, I mean, I, you know, I mean, pretty much everyone knows me. I mean, I, I'm in the environmental lane, but but I, I'm also concerned about just basic community involvement. You know, I live here in Newport and, you know, we had four people run for four positions and, you know, and so there's, you know, there's just a lack of, there's just apathy from my point of view, there's just apathy. And so, so the, 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 this, to me, you know, this is just a multi-lane freeway. So, you know, it's just wide open. So uh, Fred, did you want to- Multi-lane freeway, I like it. Yeah. Lots of, lot. We have a lot of bandwidth for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Fred, did you want to say something? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I came from the private sector, but it operates very similarly in that, you know, Usually people don't have, it's hard to get the resources needed to stay in front of these things. And I really agree with what Rachel said. You've got to, you got to get in front of it and know what opportunities are coming. By the time something posts, you're, you've already lost yet yeah, because your competition is already on it. They're in front of it. They're going to win. You're not. So to that effect, most groups don't, have, especially public groups, don't have the bandwidth to do this, as Rod suggested. And Rod, you mentioned, I think you said that the city of Toledo has engaged, did you say Sequoia to help with that? I was wondering if you could just speak just a, a few minutes to how that's worked for you, uh, what type of organization they are. I assume they're a consultant and how that's worked for you. Um, Fred, I'm actually Sequoia Consulting with oh, my team. Okay. <laughs> just, <Okay. laughs> I mean, I'll let Rod speak, obviously, yeah. but yeah, that's actually myself and my team. We're a team of six now, actually. Couple of gangers. 
<laughs> I, so, I'd still like to uh, hear from Rod since he's the he's the client on it. That'd yeah, be great. I'll, Thanks, I'll be I'll try to be brief. Um, we had um, through the CARES Act and such. I mean, then we saw the need beforehand, so we actually got in on the ground floor of Sequoia. Um, <clears throat> I've known Rachel for about three years prior to this. And um, when I heard she was heading this thing up, I said, well, that's the per perfect person to do this kind of work. Um, the thing I have enjoyed about it is not only she she's selling herself short. She's just as meticulous as Sherry is. She's just more of the face of the, of the company. Sherry, um, and Sherry wields a really good whip, I have to say. It's it's soft, but it gets everybody going in the right direction. Um, what they've been able to do for us is we've been able to garner grants and everything from city beautification and artwork to uh, how do we build um, how do we build the ties between us and Celeste so that East County can thrive in the the way the economy's working nowadays. Um, they've helped us in everything from housing to, um, I, it's whatever we've said, Hey, sick, you know, you find whatever you think works for us and let us look at it. Um, I think on average, we've looked at, I want to say about two different grants a week for the last year and a half. Um, do we want to go for that? Nah, do we want to go for that? Yes. Do we want to go for that? Well, no, nah, we don't have the, we can't keep that up. Um, so they've done a really good job of finding things and helping us write things out so that we do get many of them awarded, um, with our beautification and art Toledo grants. I think we're up around a hundred thousand dollars or more now that we've secured. And, um, it's, it's been a very good partnership. Um, we are blessed to have a rare student this year so that we're going to be able to transition some of their what they've been doing for us to the rare student. Um, but, you know, as everyone gets busier and as their name gets bigger, being in on the ground floor was nice, but I know they, they want to go to the moon. So I, I'm not going to hold them back. You're not holding us back. You guys have been amazing. We were, we were lucky. It was, it was great to work with you on that. And we got to kind of hone a little bit of our model of what we're doing too. So thank you, Rod. Yeah, we're, we're actually growing quite a bit right now because of the demand. And we're looking at, um, not quite ready to spin it out yet, but um, basically uh, it's a whole technical assistance model that involves prospecting, training, bringing together learning cohorts, and it is um, sector agnostic. The first one we're going to be probably launching in is broadband, um, but it could be uh, infrastructure, it could be housing, it could be childcare, um, any number of things. So uh, I'll let you know as that gets more rolled out, but we need it in Oregon. We need it in rural Oregon all across the state. I mean, I just would say too that, you you know, the coast is not um, isolated in its challenges. It is all of rural Oregon, and it's honestly a lot of the rural United States. So, and people deserve to be able to stay in their in their communities and have jobs and services come to them and, you know, um, maintain that quality of life. Hey, Rachel, what is Sequoia's bandwidth? I mean, are you guys able to expand and contract right now? Or the, expand? It, it expand, <laughs> yes, yes. No, we're, 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 definitely, we're definitely expanding more. So we've gone from a team of like two to a team of six in the last 12 months. Um, and we're probably going to be adding on quite a few more people too. So, so if, if we were coming into you brand new for a project, I mean, what would, from inquiry time to maybe a good first session, how long would that take in your mind? Uh, to, to inquiry to meeting with you guys, probably two to three weeks max yeah. at this point. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, why don't we take one more question from Rima, and then um, and then then we're going to be at quarter till seven. And and I know a number of you have other issues that you'd like to bring up. So Rima, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so am I understanding, Rachel, that if we had a bunch of ideas for environmental impacts for the coast, we should start developing these ideas now and start the grant writing process and have it pretty much put together, and then when we find a forecasted grant that matches it, we'll be able to jump on it. 
Is that what we should have? Like little yeah. we're gonna I be like, okay, this is that'll match this idea, and then we'll already have it, you know, almost done. That is, and it's, it will never be almost, it will not be done because each application, of course, you have to respond to this right. step, the way they've got it laid out. But like having a case statement, having a narrative, having smart objectives and goals. Um, that takes or, months. Doesn't that like take a long time to get all that, all the letter writing? I mean, don't you, I feel like that package needs to almost be, almost, I mean, of course we need, you know, help, but that the initial part almost needs to be ready, right? It does. If you want to, so the thing what I said about um, opportunities dropping is like, well, with with either state or federal, you generally have forty five to sixty days max. Sometimes it's less than that to respond to an opportunity. And I think I saw Katie Jacobson on here earlier. I don't know if she's still here, um, but she knows very well that like now, now she is kind of magic and she can pull something out overnight, but don't ask her to do that too much. <laughs> um, no, but for, for the, for, for most folks, you really need to start working on this months in advance. Um, and so you create a project and then, you know, you can work with somebody like us or others who can help you prospect and figure out what you're eligible, not only eligible for, but competitive for, depending on the project. And it's, you know, you might have five projects and he, these are your two, top two priorities, but funding comes up for the other three first. So you just kind of have to be ready to go. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to drop my I'm going to drop my uh, email into the chat over here. And I'm also going to send um, the presentation over to Martin so you guys can have access to that. But it was really nice to see all of you. And, you know, I'm happy to help. And um, yeah, just let me know. Yeah, great, great, great presentation, Rachel. And, and as I you know, mentioned, we're re recording this right now and we're, we're going to be posting it up to YouTube tomorrow. So um uh, so uh, a couple of you have other items that you'd like to bring up, and so um, why not? I'm just sort of gonna just sort of open this up, so it's just a wide open discussion, whatever. So why don't you go ahead? Let's see, Fred, you got your hand raised. Or Fred? No. I'm, yeah. I'm 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 trying to figure out the icon. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, I I just got to go ahead and I'm going to pick on Ryan because because Ryan Ryan has a couple of items that he he'd like to bring up. So Ryan, you you want to go ahead, and then 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 we'll have Rod. Well, I have a lot of stuff to say. That doesn't surprise any of you um, that know me. But I think if we're talking about community involvement. An environmental quality of life here generally. I think I'm going to take a different approach to what Rachel was saying about how the coast is in a similar plight to rural Oregon. I think the coast just got the short stick because we have to find funding to mitigate the social and environmental cost of all of the tourism that occurs here. And at the same time, a lot of these grants come from funding sources that in of themselves are contributing to some of these environmental issues, not necessarily in an active uh, nefarious way, but for example, I mean, the underwriting of Ford Foundation is Rosebrook Forest Products and they follow a model of silviculture and the science says we need to transition away from even stand um, heavily managed silviculture and try a different approach. And so my pitch has always been, and I brought this up in the commission race um, and it got no play, unfortunately, was we need a community, we need a community county owned research forest to try different conifer species and different understory models to see if we can maintain that revenue but at the same time, better protect our water, better protect our air, and better protect the wetlands that are a huge part of the quality of life in Lincoln County. And uh, there are coastal counties, Coos and Clots that have county forests. And, uh, you know, the model can be scaled up at any time as long as the county can continue to uh, 
obtain land or, or, or rotate non-productive lands into a forest model. And I think it's a great idea, um, but you know, I'm not one of three commissioners. So I think a community forest expansion outside of some of the smaller plots that are already mm -hmm. having some success at growing bigger, healthier trees, but not in the same way that they've, you know, are teaching at the College of Forestry at Oregon State, or maybe embracing a little bit more of the research that's actually occurring in the Western United States, knowing that we're having drier summers, knowing that we're having water supply problems, knowing um, some of the some of the negatives and positives of aerial pesticide spraying. Uh, all these things combine for a real opportunity to try something new because that change in climate's here and it's it's not going to diminish in its effect if the models are correct. And I can't prognosticate the future, unfortunately, otherwise I wouldn't be uh, working for the state. Um, so that's kind of my pitch is we need a, we need a county forest and I think we have the land and I think we have the experts that live here in the county as a crossover between the research community that really makes Lincoln County special and the mill and the, the um, people that work at the mill that have that mechanical know-how and the c connections between those two worlds, I think we're really set up for success to do something like that. Okay, th 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 thanks, Ryan. So um, that, that, that's a great idea. So let's see, R Rod, you, you had your hand raised? Yeah, I, I just lowered it. So I'm trying to get all my buttons done. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to take a slightly two-pronged approach. I, I want to pick up on something that Ryan said earlier uh, when he first introduced himself about um, he loves the environment and he wants to have a clean environment. I think that we can all speak more to that particular aspect, especially locally with our friends and neighbors, and get more traction um, with an environmental message. Is if we can keep it local, if we can keep it about what can we actually do. Um, I think a lot of people um, have, to be honest, I think they have no hope because within the news media, all you hear about is this catastrophe followed by that catastrophe followed by the other catastrophe. And so people tend to check out. Um, one of the things that, that frustrates me is where I want to cut greenhouse emissions probably as much or more than most people. I'm also cognizant of the fact that China puts out more greenhouse emissions than the next 10 countries combined, and that includes us. And so if you don't get China on board, you might as well just start dropping grains of sand in a bucket and see how long it takes you to get there. Um, we have to do what we can locally, but we have to give people hope. Um, a lot of what's been done in the news media is there is no hope for this solution. And we need to start figuring out a way to get people to understand, well, you're right. We can't do a dang thing about that particular polar bear in Alaska. But you know what we can do? We can fix our forest here. We can get our watershed taken care of here. We can do those things that, you know, <clears throat> the world might go burn up in 10, 20 years. But you know what? We're going <laughs> to we're going to die trying. Um, and that's probably the, the thing that I hope we can change in the course of going forward is give people hope that there is that we can make a difference right here right now in our small communities instead of just looking at the the doom and gloom in the paper yeah thanks rod let's see katie did you have your hand raised yeah you're still muted joanne has her hand raised also i i had it but i took it down so i'm good thank you okay Joanne? I was just going to suggest that I'm reading a book right now called um, <clears throat> Regeneration, which is one of my big um, causes. And it's by Paul Hawkins. And it's absolutely full of ideas about things we could do 
um, locally and worldwide, but also locally, you know, just not just regeneration of how we farm, but how we build our buildings, um, how we preserve our um, forest lands and all of that. So I would re really recommend people read that if you want some hope, because it's full of, and it's quite recent. He, you know, I think it's just published last year. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Betty? So living in Toledo is hard with GP. Um, so when we, when we form messages, we need to keep them neutral as possible, positive, and stay away from the accusatory stuff. So at this point, it, it, you know, we can't keep pointing fingers at other people and expect them to listen to us. We have to, you know, we have differences of opinion. So we need to be able to sit down across mm -hmm. from each other and have a conversation. And to do that, you can't say, well, it's your fault that this is all this way. And, you know, and then we, but we need to come up with ideas together to, to make things better. And, you know, we, it's, we're working hard in Toledo to bring serious here. And that's going to happen. The, the um, pilot project, the, the test plant, is going to be ready in January and it's going to be here for everybody to come and see how it works. And uh, you're all going to get invite, an invite to come and see it actually taking raw sewage and making it into water energy. And, uh, you know, it, yes, it will put off some carbon dioxide, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to capture that, but it will get rid of our methane too. So there are pluses, even though there are a few minuses, there's a lot more pluses. So look forward to all your invitations coming in, in the late winter. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks, Betty. Uh, you know, I remember a couple of years ago yeah. when um, Betty was giving a presentation to a bunch of us environmental yahoos, and, and she was describing the series project. So I'm just really impressed, you know, that you you actually got it funded and it's being built or has been built. So anyway, it's impressive. So CM. Thanks, Martin. And I just want to say thanks again to everyone for being a part of this. Um, I actually want to comment about something that came up in the last forum uh, right before the election in this one. And I think it's about the comment about like, you know, where is everyone? Why did we only have this many number of people running and all of that? And there is a, a considerable amount of privilege in our ability to be on this Zoom right now. Um, last night, the Newport City Council and the Planning Commission had a joint work session to just really look at the housing inventory what is the production strategy and how cost burdened folks are in our community. And I bring that up because it is a, it is a luxury that we can be on these Zooms, that our basic needs are more or less being met, that we can be in, engaged and involved in civic life. I also do think that there, it's not about apathy. It's there, you know, everyone has their own priorities. And I feel like I go to places and see people show up in so many different ways in our community. It's just, they didn't pick this way to show up, but it doesn't mean they're not super engaged. It doesn't mean they're not, they don't care. It doesn't mean they're not working to make this community, our beloved coast air, coastal area, a better place. Um, so I, I think that would be a, a wrong assertion to just say like that, that there's an apathy piece, because I don't think that's accurate. Uh, we were at the League of Oregon Cities conference and we spent the counselor workshop, the first day of the conference, talking about civic engagement. And again, it comes back to when you have your basic needs met, when you're not worrying about childcare, when you're not worrying about food on the table or inflation, all of that, then maybe you have some mental capacity to, to have some free time. And you know what? A lot of people are like, let me stream something or play a game or something else. And as much as I am, you know, wish they were all super gung ho about city government or county activities, guess what? They're not. That's okay. We're a special breed. And so I just, I want to give space and, and respect for people doing hard work and a lot of physical labor, a lot of um, domestic labor. And just not having bandwidth or capacity for this. And they're doing other things. They're going to their kids' 
soccer games, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I just wanted to close on, on that comment. Like, just because we aren't seeing them doesn't mean they aren't making great differences in our communities. Th thanks, Sam. Um, um, Sydney, and uh, you know, we, we, we've hit the magic hour of seven o'clock. And so maybe we can try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. So Sydney, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, and my comment is kind of more uh, end of meeting type of um, thoughts. So for future meetings, I'm wondering, you know, what the specific goals are, like, are we trying to bring it, like, should I be trying to um, try harder to get more attendees? Do we want people participating or, or just kind of tuning in? Um, I did advertise it a few places, and I think people are kind of having a hard time coming back from um, post-COVID, like getting back involved in their groups. We used to have a local group that was had a bunch of members, and now I'm trying to like kind of bring them back together. So I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were about like what the direction should be and what you'd like us to do um, to contribute to the goal. And... and Ironically, Sydney, that's exactly what I was going to bring up next. So, 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 so I guess the question is, is I mean, do, do we want to, you know, schedule another meeting, say, say like in another month and then, uh, you know, and, and maybe people have some thoughts of, you know, what you, you would like to have covered at the next month. And uh, so, so, yeah, so, um, I mean, our folks up for, uh, you know, having a meeting once again, like in another month or so, and then uh, you know what, 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 what should the focus be? I mean, should should we should, should we continue on this this theme of um, you know working together to try to bring in more federal and state dollars? Should, I mean, should we try and figure out what, you know, like Rachel was saying, we should have our projects, all our ideas of what we want to do all ready and kind of packaged for when a grant is proposed? Should we try and figure out what those things we're going to focus on is, what they're going to be? Yeah, well, that's... I, I think there, there's obviously all sorts of different grants out there and there's there's different groups you know that that you know that would be focusing in on one particular grant or not um, but uh, but Ron so uh, I just wanted to speak to that point from Rihanna uh, Rima sorry um, the big thing to have when you when you get down doing this grant stuff is to have all of your um, all of your studies, all of your facts in a already put together, because that's how things go together quickly. If you have to go out and grab facts while you're trying to do the grant, it's hard. It, it just becomes way too difficult because of the timelines involved. So uh, my recommendation uh, would be that as a group, we narrow ourselves down to maybe one or two things and then try to get those done over the next six months, as far as getting a grant for that. Um, next month is really problematic, at least for, for me, between my work at the high school and city government and statewide stuff that I'm doing. So next month is probably not gonna be a good one for me to be involved in a meeting, um, but don't make it on my account. So if y'all can do it, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rod. Fred? Yeah, I think my comment is uh, very similar, complementary to what Rod was just talking about. Uh, perhaps uh, it's, it's working on that project description, uh, making sure that you can describe what your project is, um, who your partners are, uh, those get that background information, your, you know, what's, what supports it and, and any sort of uh, regulatory uh, things such as forest plans or things like that, that, that support that by doing the project are supported by these various plans. In other words, how, 
David Gomberg said, send us a letter describing, give us your narrative. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's coming back together and talking about what does that project description look like? What does it entail? What does that narrative, that letter that you're going to write to David Gomberg and to Dick Anderson and to senators, what needs to be in it? Um, that's your thumbnail sketch. And to take it forward from there, then you got to flesh it out for all the bullets that are in that, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Betty? So this group is has been an environmental group for as long as I've known. And um, I think it needs to stay focused on that primarily. I mean, the other things, yes, we want involvement and that, but we want involvement of everybody on the environmental issues. But I'm thinking what we really need to do as a group is come up with a list of projects, whether they're small or large, for our for the county or the area or the region however we want to do it but but come up with some some projects that we want to work on and you know narrow that down to two or three or whatever you know five ten whatever to look for grants for but right now i don't even know what our projects are so writing all the other information isn't going to happen because we don't know the projects yet. So we need to make a list of projects that we're really interested in working on as a group. Because I see a lot of different people here from a lot of different backgrounds and areas. And I know there are more of us waiting in the wings to, to help with projects and help with things, but we don't, we have to have a, a list. We have to have some kind of idea of what we want to do. It, yeah, so it's so actually, Betty, I, I actually put together a list of federal grants about, you know, seven or eight, nine months ago, and I, I'll, you know, it's, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll, I'll send that out to everybody. But, you know, there, 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 there's a number of, um, and, and this is specifically in regards to the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed, and, and like one of them, which, you know, I think probably most people would be pretty supportive of, is uh, electrifying the school buses. And so, you know, and so that funding is probably going to be coming up sometime soon. So anyways, uh, why don't I, I'll send out that list uh, to everybody and, uh, and, and then, and then, and then, and then I, you know, because I'm obviously here in the environmental line, I, I sort of like your thought about, you know, working not, not, not exclusively in the environmental lane though, but, but there are a whole bunch of environmental projects that we could be submitting bids on and so um uh so anyway so so i uh, so so i guess my question is is um do do we want to have a meeting in december and and i know sydney's raised her hand so um but anyway why, why don't you pose your question sydney and then that way we can ask question of should we meet in december or january well, that, that was part of what I was going to say was, um, I think for the sake of momentum, it is important to at least try to do a December meeting. It could be earlier in December, um, just to kind of keep it on people's minds and uh, keep the engagement that we do have. Like, I think this is a really good group with a lot of repeat attendees, which is really, really good thing. And we could maybe make the next meeting focus specifically more in detail about Ryan's forest idea, maybe just as a a starter topic since there's a lot of interest um, that I'm seeing and reading. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so um, so I guess maybe well, like the first or second, maybe the second week in December or the first week in December. I mean, that'd be coming up pretty quickly, but maybe mm -hmm. the second week in December. That's still a little bit away from Christmas. So I don't, that's a bad week for me because the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Microplastics has an event on December 12th and 13th that I'm attending. So I won't be around for that, but the, maybe the, the after the new year, I'd be available. Maybe we can talk about things on email. Would that be easier? Just. Yeah, so, so, so sometimes it is, Raymond, sometimes me. it's not um 
They say Rod. So why don't we do this? Since it sounds like, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like we want to at least put our toe in the water on the forest idea. Why don't we put our heads together on email, on Martin's email chain, um, about the forest idea, go ahead and have the meeting in December, um, and then whatever ideas that are out there, and, and Ryan certainly can look those over um, and then give his response also. Um, but, and I can't speak for Casey, um, but you know what? I think it would be a really good thing if there was some sort of a, for lack of a better word, at least a feeler out there at that first county commissioner's meeting about here's a group that has an idea it is a you know it's a kernel of an idea we'll say but we have several things already fleshed out about it by that time and would the county be open to having discussions about making it happen just a thought yeah i think we just need to drill into anything like I, cause now I've got some inventory that I need to check into, um, you know, for me, maybe creating the time for this is going to be harder until after January, but now I've got a series of ideas to follow up on. So like Martin was saying, if this is just going to be an open highway, then yeah, I'll, um, you know, commit to a month out and further discussing and maybe bring some of my own research to the table <clears throat> on County Forests. Um, so I just think if it's um, topic driven, um, I like the composure of this group, and I think only good things can come from discussions. And if some months, maybe meetings are small because people have got stuff going on. I mean, I won't take it personal, but I'll commit to try and, you know, being there until I say, no, this isn't for me. So, yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so uh, do, do, do we want to have the meeting in the first week of December then? I think those who can meet up maybe should. And if we call it shorter because there's not a lot of engagement and then we just keep pushing and do the email thing too. That's just my, my idea. You guys go take it where you want it. Okay. Well, let, let, let me get my calendar. And Ryan, do you have anything about that forest idea already that you've put together? Well, I've actually thought at great length about it and kind of have a bunch of bullet points that would one the structure of it, one the funding, one the location, and then the partners. You know, at the minimum, we need a plot of land to partner with the school district and teach our kids here about forest careers. At the bare minimum, that's the floor. Anything we can accomplish above that. It would be a win for the whole county, you know. Um, yeah, maybe I can just bullet point the the idea prior to the next meeting, and if I can make it great, if not, I'll just observe the recorded meeting and maybe provide my thirty seconds of uh, clarifying the idea, maybe afterwards. Well. Uh, well, you know, looking at the previous week, uh, Tuesday, December 6th, Wednesday, December 7th, or Thursday, December 8th, and I know you obviously have city council meetings, you know, um, Tuesday for some odd reason. I, I, don't, I don't think any of the cities have council meetings on a Tuesday, but um, I, I mean, do, do, do you want to look at December 6th, the Tuesday? I prefer to do the Thursday because if we're in a six hour meeting on Mondays, I don't necessarily want to do back to back days. It's kind of hard on the parental time. So, okay. So, so like Thursday, December 8th. If you go ahead and send out a thing, I, I, I will commit to it once I see it, you know, but that sounds fine. Uh, okay. Do, do other people have any objections to the December 8th? Okay. So the only objection I know is, is Joanne, she's objecting to having a six o'clock meeting because that's when she eats dinner. So um, we, 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 we can change it. I like seven. seven, much better. Yeah, so, so, so we can change it to 7 p.m. 
Okay. Well, anyways, I appreciate everybody showing up. And as I said, this is recorded and I'll post this up onto YouTube and I'll, I'll send out the link to everybody and, you know, please feel free to share it. Uh, so um, anyways, have a good night, everybody. And hopefully you see you next month, Thursday at seven o'clock on December 8th. So take care. Thank you, Martin. Thanksgiving. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, you're welcome.